The year is 1854. A fur trader named Alexander Faribault looks over these bluffs to the land below. He sees a river, teepees, a couple of houses. He sees people. He sees potential. With blood connections to both the Native Americans and the white settlers, he's the perfect leader. All that is needed to form this new, booming community is in place. The year is 1855. Faribault is a small town in southern Minnesota. It has around 23,000 residents, all living in a space under 16 square miles. Not much could happen, right? <laughs> I'm Samuel Temple. I'm Logan Ledman. This television series, 1855, will tell the stories of people and places of Faribault. Where else to start than with the namesake of the town himself, Alexander Faribault. We started off our search for his story with Sue Garwood, the executive director of the Rice County Historical Society, to gain insight into the life of this seminal character in the tale of Faribault. It was pivotal. It was absolutely incredible. Uh, in When one thinks about the War of 1812, typically you only think about the battles that took place in um, on the East Coast. Uh, in fact, our, our national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, is talking about a battle that took place during the War of 1812. But they, the British got in very far into the United States, in fact, far enough down following the river out of Canada, and they burned Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin. And what they did at that time is they captured all of the men and most particularly in our case is Jean-Baptiste Faribault, captured all the fur traders and put them in prison, or actually they tried to press them into the service, as was the British way. Jean-Baptiste refused and so he was held in prison. Pelagie and Alexander, who was the oldest of their, of their children, who was six at the time, and Lucy, his little sister who was four. Pelagie, uh, those were the only two born at the time. He had, um, I believe there were 10 in total. And, um, but Lucy and Alexander being born before the war, and then his siblings being born after the war, they were much different. Um, a couple of significant um, in Minnesota history would be Oliver Faribault, who was also a fur trader, and David Faribault, who actually married a Dakota woman and lived more with the Dakota than um, in following his mother's footsteps rather than following his father's. Pelagie grabbed Alexander and Lucy and escaped, canoed over to the Indians, her family in Wabasha. Alexander and Lucy and Pelagie lived with them throughout the duration of the war. And so when one thinks about Alexander, it's important to remember his first language would have been Dakota. His second was French. His third was English. And the kinship relationships that he formed during the four to five years that he was with the Dakota from the age of six to ten made a lasting impact on his life and his relationships with the Dakota. Well, he would have been a, you know, a, a typical fur trader's son. Um, certainly early on in Prairie du Chien, they were building up the community and so, and both Pelagie and, and uh, Jean-Baptiste were very well respected, so he would have had other playmates and so on. Um, after the war, the Jean-Baptiste, who had been a British citizen, or French-Canadian citizen, um, at the time became an American citizen after the war and switched companies that he was trading for and began uh, moved with the family. The American army wanted to establish a fort to, because again, the British had gotten into Prairie du Chien. They realized how vulnerable this was. And so they wanted to create a fort at the point where the Minnesota and the Mississippi rivers meet that was both about keeping peace between the Dakota and the Ojibwe, as well as ensuring that there weren't other invasions from the north. And Jean-Baptiste and Alexander, of course, and Pelagie and the whole family moved to Minnesota before Minnesota was even Minnesota. Yeah, at the, uh, you know, the whole state of Minnesota, um, you have settlers here from uh, 
you know, the Scandinavian countries. Uh, you have uh, people here from Norway, from Germany, from Poland. Um, you know, so so much of uh, you know Eastern and Western Europe, Middle Europe, um, were the ones that migrated here. Um, I know my ancestors were cabinet makers back in Norway, and um, you know they sold everything and came here for you know free land and land of opportunity. And they first settled down by Albert Lee, and then their land was flooded. So then they moved from Albert Lee, Minnesota, to South Dakota, and uh, I actually. Um, my it would be my grandfather's brother actually kept a diary, and I remember he said that uh, um, when he got to South Dakota they got off the train, and there were no trees and it was just flat and uh, and how he made fun of the land like why are we here you know what would encourage us to move here, and um, but then that's where they set their roots and that's that's where I was born and raised and uh, and then I've migrated back to Minnesota you know so some of my roots here so my mom has roots from Poland. Um, that came over here and uh, and uh, and farmed as well. So I think farming was a big push for people to migrate over. And um, you know, many of the French Canadians, you know, along the St. Lawrence Seaway, were fur traders. And then after that got saturated, they had to move west to find new tributaries and, and new areas to trap. Which you know, now you're bringing fur traders together. You're bringing farmers together. You're bringing people that work in factories together. And uh, you know, so it was just that Western migration for always people trying to better themselves, looking for new opportunities. So we've referred to the fur trade a lot in the last few minutes. What is that exactly? Well, fur trade, simply put, is the exchange of goods where fur is used as the currency. As mm -hmm. Europeans and Native Americans began interacting, both groups realized that there was a desire for trade among them. Okay. Europeans craved furs for use in fashion, such as hats and jackets and coats. Native Americans wanted the more reliable and efficient European tools for skills such as hunting and sewing and keeping warm. With this realization, the fur trade was born and changed the relationship between Native Americans and Europeans drastically. Okay. Because these folks were the fur traders, and they were not migrating for a better land like many Americans did. These were businessmen, and they were following the business. They went pretty much from Prairie du Chien straight to what's now Mendota. In fact, uh, they established Mendota. When you go to Mendota today, you can see the Sibley House, but also on that same land is the Faribault House, and that's the Jean-Baptiste Faribault House. And Pelagie's Island is now known as Pike's Island and is a part of a historic site. They lived in Mendota, is the answer, really, and they, or what is now Mendota, and they remained there their entire lives, Jean-Baptiste and Pelagie did. When he turned 16, Alexander got what's called a license to trade. I sort of think of it as like a driving, driver's license. He couldn't trade independently, um, but he had the ability to trade, be a fur trader with a more uh, fully bonded fur trader, so that was his dad. So he very early on knew which direction he was going and at the age of 16 began trading with his father. And at the age of 21 became an independent fur trader. So that would have been in uh, 1827. Um, and, uh, but just two years before that, at the age of 19, he had married Mary Elizabeth Graham. At a time when it wasn't uncommon for fur traders to have multiple wives, Jean-Baptiste had only one, Pelagie, and Alexander had only one, Mary Elizabeth. And so they, were, they came from a family that is perhaps of mixed race, but of very much what we would consider more traditionalist um, European marriage um, concepts and values. Certainly before the 1862 U.S. Dakota conflict, he would have been uh, really perceived more as white. He was a young man, a businessman. He was a fur trader, um, but he that the fur trade began to wane, and by the 1840s here in what is now Faribault, they were operating a farm. Uh, for, um, sugaring camp and so on. He was also very involved in government because of his good friend Henry Sibley and he was just sort of at the cusp of change as we went from a territory to a community or land that was open to settlement and so he too went with that flow moving from being a fur trader to being a businessman. 
Alexandra Ferber was an ideal choice as a translator, with his ability to empathize and communicate with both the white settlers and the Native Americans. When we talked with Scott Hansen, Dean of Students at Faribault's Bethlehem Academy, he explained the importance of Faribault's ability to form connections between cultures. Alexander Faribault was more of a, uh, um, you know, could, could bridge the gap between white settlers and Dakota Indians, and, and I think the language, he could speak the language, and that was really an important piece. And, uh, and not only that, but he understood the heritage of the Dakota Indians. And, um, and, and that's, you know, the same thing today. I, I think a lot of the conflict that people have in the United States today is, is just you have groups of people and races of people that if they just took time to understand each other's culture, understand each other's language, you would have less conflict. But, but it, it just seems like life is so fast-paced that we sometimes fail to do that. And I think Alexander Faribault did a, did a great job of that. One of the treaties that Alexander Ferber helped translate for was the Treaty of Traverse des Sioux. This influential treaty signed over 24 million acres of land from the various Indian tribes indigenous to those areas to the United States government. Due to the increasingly scarce amount of animals to hunt on their land, many Native American tribes felt pressured into accepting this treaty and the guaranteed annuity payments that would come with it. This decision was not without its controversy. One of the items the Indian chiefs were asked to sign without explanation was called the Trader's Paper. This paper allowed the government to siphon funds from the Native Americans' payments and give it to white and uh, mixed race settlers who claimed a debt from the government. Understandably, even though they may have accepted the conditions if it had been explained to them, many of the chiefs felt cheated by this deception and this was a source of major conflict. Governor Alexander Ramsey and Commissioner Luke Lee's report to Congress about the treaties of 1851 say this, it was our constant aim to break up the community system of these Indians and cause them to recognize the individuality of property. If timely measures are taken for the proper location and management of these tribes, they may, at no distant period, become an intelligent and Christian peoples. You know, you go back to um, Alexander Faribault, he helped establish a lot of things that date back to the end of the Civil War. And um, so we had a civil war going on between the northern states and the southern states, you know, over states' rights, over slavery, over, um, you know, many tariffs and issues and money issues. And it was, a, it was a war between the states, but there was still western expansion happening right here, you know, and there were a lot of Indian wars that took place. And, uh, you know, the uh, Dakota War actually started right outside of New Ulm and Flandre, where Flandreau State Park is today. And that's where that war took place, and, and that's what it was all about. It was all about those wars took place because the Native Americans had a spiritual way of life. They had sacred lands and sacred uh, areas. And then as settlers moved west, um, came across those lands, and you have two groups of people who don't understand each other, which then leads to conflict. People were moving west fast, and um, you know the United States government gave away land on the Homestead Act, mentioned that land was part of Indian culture and Indian heritage for many years and and now the um, native people saw this as being that you know that it wasn't for everyone to share anymore it was about who owned what and and this fence divided this and that fence divided this so so there was a real huge cultural gap between the Dakota Indians and the, and the white settlers and um, but throughout history it's good to have people like Alexander Faribault who helped um, you know, not only the white settlers, but also help the Native American people as well, too. And, and, um, and you know, that's what I think is an important piece, is that he, ha he was a relationship builder. The Treaty of Traverse des Sioux was one of the strains on the relationship between the United States and the Native Americans. Eventually, these strains led to a series of conflicts known as the U.S.-Dakota War. Alexander Faribault took part in this war as a soldier for the U.S. and saw fighting in the Battle of Birch Coulee. This was the most fatal battle of the war. Miraculously, Alexander survived but never really recovered. Life after the war was very strenuous for anyone with Dakota blood. They tell the story about how John Voigt, was his name, was um, quite ill and had actually collapsed in the farm field. Dakota, a couple of Dakota warriors were off on a hunting expedition and saw him there, um, thought he was drunk, and ignored him, went on to do their hunting. And on their way back through his land, 
they saw that he was still there and thought, well, let's just go give him a hard time. And they approached him all ready to, um, to give him a hard time for being a drunk, um, only to discover that he was in fact very ill through and, and barely conscious um, through um, broken English and sign language and so on. They assessed the situation and communicated to him that they were going to pick him up and take him to Faribault. And they didn't mean the town, they meant Alexander. I think that story speaks a lot about the role that Alexander had in, he was respected by both. Um, this was, in that instance, it's an example of how this house was one of the earliest hospitals. It was a trusted place. The Dakota who knew Alexander would take care of this man, and they did. They dropped him off here, and he was nursed back to health here in the house. Um, so I think that's important. Across Rice County, though, the ethnic diversity is less melting pot. Um, certainly near Nurstrand, it's a strong Norwegian community. Near um, Shieldsville and Erin Township is a strong Irish community. Millersburg was the Swedish community. Lonsdale was the Slavic community. Uh, Morristown had a big German uh, population. So as is typical of the county seat, uh, of any county, Faribault, although began with a, a more, um, a, a less diversified ethnic population within a short period of time, really reflected the immigrant movement into the United States. The town of Faribault grew increasingly hostile with Alexander's ties to the Dakota and his generosity in helping them. In response, he sent a letter to the newspaper saying, I trust that no person will contend that these Indians, after rendering to the country such service, should be sent off to be killed by hostile tribes. I know these Indians well, and I know them to be innocent, harmless, and good persons. The years following the U.S., Dakota, and Civil War was a time of great growth for the city of Faribault. The populace continued to grow, businesses began to pop up, and sticking to his generous nature, Alexander Faribault donated large plots of land to schools wanting to be built in southern Minnesota. That's why we now have the Deaf School, the Blind School, and Shattuck St. Mary's. This wide variety of educational opportunities eventually gave Faribault the nickname the Athens of the West. I think if people understand the whole perspective of events in history will really gain a, an appreciation for each other, you know, based on your heritage and my heritage and Sam's heritage and, and, um, and you know, you know, look at the city of Faribault. We have, uh, we have so many different uh, ethnic groups, um, you know, with the different populations. And I think uh, it'd be real good for the city of Faribault to, to, to really, you know, bring people together to see why we're all here. Or how did we all get here? It all goes back to you know, if you want to know where you're going, you have to know where you've been. And, you know, this community is a vibrant, great community. We have great people. We have, we have great community leaders. Um, you know, we have great things happening in the city of Faribault. And, and I think people today need to understand that, is that, you know, going back to Alexander Faribault's time when he was here, you know, they're facing some of the same issues that we're facing today, you know, based on you know, ethnic groups based on, um, you know, religious beliefs, based on, you know, economics and how people make a living and how people live. And, and, and I, I really truly believe that Alexander Faribault, by understanding him, that's going to help our city of Faribault today to keep that tradition going, that we're helping groups of people, that we're learning about groups of people, and we want to make our community the best it can be, um, you know, not only for our generation, but for future generations as well, too. And I know the city of Faribault is, you know, talking about, you know, Faribault in the year 2040 and envisioning what that's going to look like. And, and those groups have done a great job of bringing the different ethnic groups together in Faribault. And, um, and I think that is a you know, huge impact to the future of our city. Back in the 1860s, Alexander Faribault was beginning to feel the repercussions of his over-generosity. The obsolescence of his fur trading skills due to the waning of the trade certainly didn't help. In 1866, he began selling his property, and the government began removing the Dakota from his land as he couldn't support them anymore. In desperation, he tried starting a flour mill in Fergus Falls in 1874. A year later, his wife, Mary Elizabeth, died. His flour mill was unsuccessful, 
and he returned to Faribault to live with his sons. In the 1880 census, for the first time ever, Alexander Faribault was listed not as white, but as Indian, and he was at the bottom of his household list. Alexander Faribault died in 1882, broke at the age of 76. He left behind a booming, diverse, and growing town. At his funeral, Reverend Thomas O'Gorman had this to say. Mr. Alexander Faribault had every quality that goes to make the pioneer of civilization. Love of nature, brotherly kindness for the poor wandering children of the prairies, energy to push on, physical strength to endure, and above all, a faith. Ever and everywhere the gentleman. There will be mourning in the Indian wigwams for Alexander Faribault, as well as in the civilized homes of Minnesota. The story of Alexander Faribault will go down in the unwritten tradition of Indian legend, as well as in the printed records of an American city. For he was a bond, a trusted agent between the two races, and the connection was a benefit and a blessing to both. Logan and I would like to thank Sue Garwood and Scott Hansen for those spectacular interviews and of course the Rice County Historical Society. We'd like to thank Ann Bymers who did our promotional photography which you can find at our Facebook page. PBS is brought to you by viewers like you. Thank you. I don't Be think sure you're to, allowed to say that. <laughs> Be sure to tune in next month as we talk about local and statewide legend Bruce Smith. See you then.